Good morning, uh, afternoon, evening, whichever the case may be. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar where we're launching the policy brief, Enabling Sustainable Lifestyles in a Climate Emergency. Uh, my name is Marcus Carson. I'm an Associate Professor of Sociology and Senior Fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute and co-lead of the Lifestyles and Education Program under the One Planet Network. The program's led by Sweden and Japan via the Stockholm Institute and Japan's Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. This policy brief put together by the Harukul Institute is an important element in the toolbox that we need to address what's often described as our triple crisis. I know you're familiar with the crisis crises. Uh, they include climate change, biodiversity loss, and waste. And over the past few years, we've come to understand the enormous role that lifestyles and household-based consumption play, not only in fueling these crises, but also their importance for addressing them. Uh, the message comes through very clearly in the most recent IPCC uh, Working Group 3 report, uh, and you'll hear more about that over the course of the webinar. There are other problems we need to grapple with at the same time. Uh, in wealthy countries, overconsumption is fueling our environmental crises. Uh, and all too often, it doesn't make people especially satisfied or happy. Uh, and at the same time, household consumption in many places in the world is insufficient to meet basic needs. So we need to rebalance those uh, both. And while it's clear that lifestyle changes and changes in aspirations and household consumption patterns are a prerequisite to addressing climate change, biodiversity, waste, we simply can't expect households and individuals to bear all the responsibility for making these changes, not least because households steer only a portion of the problem. So lifestyles and household-based consumption are part of a matrix or a larger puzzle that also in includes other important players that will come into the discussion here today. Uh, the next one up is commercial enterprises, which along with their supply chains represent the supply side of this consumption equation. The second is civil society organizations. They influence how we think, uh, they what we value, and through which we often channel our wants and expectations. It includes governments at both the local and the national level. They incentivize certain types of consumption uh, and uh, also regulate options that may endanger health, may endanger well-being or other national interests. And the fourth is international institutions through which cooperation and coordination uh, can be channeled to not only work for consensus on the nature of the problems, but also how to tackle them. So with those things in mind, I'd like to introduce briefly our guest today. I'll say just a few things about each one, and then I'll go to basically the ground rules for uh, or some housekeeping for our webinar. Uh, our first panelist opening keynote is Mr. Amitabh Kant, presently CEO of the NITI IOG, uh, which is an institute in the government of India chaired by the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi himself. NITI's goal is to catalyze the development process and nurture an overall enabling environment by working in partnership with states. <laughs> uh, being a knowledge hub and a think tank and facilitating implementation. The aim is to foster involvement and participation of state governments in policymaking, really important here in this webinar, and enhance cooperative federalism. Okay. Our panelists, um, Julia Steinberger. Julia is a professor of societal challenges of climate change at the University of uh, Lausanne and the lead author of the Working Group 3 report, which covers the, uh, brings newly uh, important information on lifestyles. Uh, Emma Norian is a member of parliament here in Sweden and chair of the cross-party committee on environmental objectives. Uh, Emma is um, a marine biologist who got engaged in politics and her main political focus uh, is in environment and climate, international development, cooperation, and of course, marine water issues. Our next panelist is Magnus Bengtsson. Magnus is the policy lead at the Hotter Cole Institute and a lecturer at the Toyo University in Tokyo. Magnus has over 20 years of experience as a policy researcher 
also advising governments on sustainable consumption and production. And Magnus is a co-author of the policy brief that uh, brings us here today. And Elise Tonda, who's the head of the consumption and production unit at the United Nations Environment Program. Um, Elise uh, is currently the head of this unit. Uh, she's been with UNEP for over 12 years and is an environmental engineer by training. So uh, just a few housekeeping items so everyone knows how the, uh, the webinar will proceed. The context is the IPCC Working Group 3 report that highlights uh, for the first time these consumption questions and the importance of circularity. Uh, we'll uh, introduce panelists as we go. This is a live event. Uh, it'll be recorded. You won't be able to turn on your mic or video, but please post your questions using the Q&A function. Uh, so you can find that under the chat box icon with a question mark. And when you do so, please remember to add your name and organization. And my colleagues then will forward the questions uh, uh, to me. We won't be able to cover all the questions, but uh, they'll select out some that are most, that seem to fit most what the discussion is that we're in the midst of. So those are the basic uh, ground rules for our webinar. Let me briefly introduce uh, Mr. Amita, uh, Amita Kant um, with a little bit of background. The COP26 in Glasgow uh, saw Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi reminding us that lifestyles have an enormous role in climate change and pro proposed a one word movement. Uh, this one word in the context of climate can become the basic foundation of one world. And the word is life lifestyle for environment. And this could become a mass movement for environmentally conscious, and I would add more satisfying lifestyles. To accomplish that goal, we need mindful and deliberate use of resources rather than mindless and destructive consumption. And in this context, Mr. Kant will provide more context of the life movement, how it links to policies and the focus uh, of the policy brief being launched. So Mr. Kant, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my fellow panelists, uh, I'm delighted to join you for the launch of the policy brief on enabling sustainable lifestyles in a climate emergency by the United Nations Environment Program. Today, one of the biggest challenges around us undeniably is the threat posed by climate change. The latest report of the UNFCC in the words of the UN Secretary General is a code red for humanity. Therefore, this launch comes at a time when the threat posed by unmitigated climate change is real and more palpable than ever before. Climate change has become an extremely important point of focus for all countries across the world. We all must understand that how we act today will have a huge impact on the future of our world, which we all have a collective responsibility towards. The key is climate consciousness, climate justice, and climate action. We are all living through times of a global pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has taught us a very critical lesson to all of us in the global community. Despite our incredible scientific and technological prowess, we remain at the mercy of the natural world. The throwaway culture that exists and consumerism further worsens the climate change. The transition to a circular economy from today's take, make, use, dispose economy is the need of the hour. India has always displayed strong climate leadership. The UN General Assembly's GAP report outlines that India is the only G20 country whose nationally determined contributions are two degree compliant. We have, a, we have built a globally competitive renewable energy industry. We have world-class clean energy players with top-notch execution capabilities. 
As many of you may be aware, India has made bold and forward looking commitments at COP26 in the form of the Panch Amrit formula given by the Prime Minister. India has demonstrated climate leadership and our commitments towards reducing emissions are supported by concrete short term action. And these include cutting India's total projected carbon emission by 1 billion tons by 2030, reducing the carbon intensity of the nation's economy by less than 45% by the end of the decade and net zero carbon emissions by 2070. At COP26 and various other platforms, Prime Minister Modi has underscored the need for the world to come together and take lifestyle for environment, life forward as a mass movement of environmental conscious lifestyle. We cannot reduce the carbon footprint without fundamentally changing how we behave as individuals and the activities which we undertake on a daily basis. We need action now and we need individual behavioral change rather than fixing long term goals of 2050, etc. Climate conscious behavior and lifestyles are inherently linked. If you look at the many countries, their lifestyles are based on wastages of resources, excessive use of personal vehicles, lights remaining switched on all night and wastage of water are just some of the many examples. In India, we have a way of life which engenders respect for the environment and nature. The average carbon footprint per person in India is 0 0.56 tons per year, which is significantly lower than the global average of four tons. Therefore, there is a lot of lessons to be learned from the lives of Indian citizens. Indians have ingrained social norms and belief systems which have a direct positive impact on their carbon footprint. This is applicable across household levels, activities such as food consumption patterns, transport user choices and energy and water management. This is not just limited to households with a long history of functioning in resource constrained environments. Agrarian societies in India have adopted and adapted themselves as well. This is reflected in irrigation and farming practices such as the construction of traditional water bodies to cope with water related stress and the widespread practice of planting neem, banyan and peepal trees alongside built structures. As stated by the Prime Minister, Mr. Modi, India's relationship with its environment has been one of the mindful and deliberate utilization. There's a need to study this relationship in greater depth and identify ways of leveraging the existing social norms for creating meaningful behavioral change among individuals. And behavioral change is key and therefore nudging individuals towards this is critical. Life or lifestyle, lifestyle for environment is India's contribution to the global climate crisis. Through the life campaign, we can encourage people to recognize the significant impact of their seemingly small actions on climate change. In his address to the World Economic Forum, the Prime Minister introduced the idea of a P3, pro-planet people movement that underlines India's climate change commitments at the Global Forum. The time is now right to mobilize action and make the life movement and the life campaign into a pro planet people mass movement. Much similar to the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, the clean India mission, wherein a concerted and sustained effort by individuals, households and communities became the key driver of ramping up sanitation coverage across the country in a relatively short span of time. Our philosophy is that climate change must now become a movement of the masses. We cannot combat climate change without the participation of people. We all must actively think of ways in which we nudge citizens towards climate friendly practices. 
To translate Prime Minister Modi's vision of life into reality, it is vital to explore novel, novel approaches that can nudge climate positive behavior in individuals. Individual action in turn can unleash a mass movement by encouraging and inspiring other members of the society. We are very glad that we are working with the UN on taking this vision forward. I'm certain that your policy brief would offer useful insights and propose impactful interventions which can help governments and businesses kickstart the transition to sustainable lifestyles. We look forward to continued collaboration on the adaption of sustainable lifestyles for countering climate change. We must now turn this into a global movement and through this policy brief, UNEP has already taken a much welcome first step. India would fully support this. I'm truly delighted to deliver this keynote address and I look forward to a very fascinating panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khan, for a very uh, inspiring and I think especially insightful uh, opening for our webinar. There are just a couple of points that you made. I think that were especially important. One is the importance of a mass movement. And the second is this question of how to catalyze that kind of movement that's necessary to tackle this. Uh, we hope uh, and believe that these policy actions along the lines that uh, you're pointing to and that the policy brief speaks to is part of that catalyzing process. Uh, and I wonder if you have uh, just an observation or two to make on that and then we'll move on to our panelists. So I'm absolutely convinced that without a mass movement, uh, we cannot make a We just lost the sound there. You just went uh, still muted. Now we're going. So without a mass movement, it will not be possible. And therefore, uh, when we did uh, uh, the Clean India movement, we actually nudged people into behavioral change. It's not about hardware. It's about the softer elements. It's about changing people's lifestyle. It's about changing every individual's behavior. It's about making people realize that they're making a difference to the world. It's about creating a huge, huge movement based on changing the mindset of individuals. And this would require a collaborative effort with think tanks, with individuals, uh, with universities, with a whole lot of, uh, you know, generating a huge movement around the world. It's not governments which are going to change. It's not just the private sector which is going to change. It's the individuals which are going to change. It's not it's not political leadership which will transform the world. It will be the individual behavior which will transform the world. Long term goals of 2050 are not important. It's the short term change of individuals which will change the world. Thank you very much. And it, I think this emphasis of uh, movement and the puzzle pieces that we need to put together with uh, governments having a catalyzing role uh, is is so central to, to generating this kind of movement. And uh, we will come to that. But first, let's let's go over to the IPCC report, uh, because in addition to the importance of lifestyles uh, that Mr. Kant in India uh, have spoken to and pointed to, the latest IPCC report represents a real, a real paradigm shift in the way that we think about climate action. Uh, the report points out that if people are provided the opportunities to make choices uh, supported by policy, supported by the, the product options that are sustainable, there's an untapped potential for mitigation that could bring down global emissions by between 40 and 70 percent by 2050 compared to the baseline scenarios. So what that means in practice is that the potential to vastly accelerate uh, a process that's been all too slow already uh, exists if we can generate this sort of a movement and trigger, nudge, sort of move that process along. So I'd like to pass this over uh, now to Julia Steinberger, 
uh, and Julia to present some of the highlights of the report uh, that you uh, that you led. Um, so if we can. I'll pass the floor to you here. Thank you so much, Marcus. And thanks to uh, to Mr. Kant for his uh, for his talk. So um, I should immediately say that uh, I was involved in the IPCC Working Group Three Six Assessment Report, um, but I'm going to be speaking about chapters where I was involved, but not as a, a lead author. So, but uh, nevertheless, uh, really um, exciting things to report on here. And so you already mentioned the headline message. Um, that the, the IPCC report um, at Working Group 3 points out for the first time sort of opens the box of demand and says if we look at demand reductions, can we look, can we see what potential they have and can we see if they can be done while um, preserving human well-being and even uh, improving it? And the answer is that demand reductions have a huge, huge uh, potential. So as soon as you start looking at demand and, and wondering what it can do for you, you see that the, the potential is really tremendous. And as you mentioned, it's anywhere from 40 to 70 percent um, uh, emissions reductions, depending on the sector. And so this is a huge um, step forward. Uh, in some ways, it's a bit too bad that it took the sixth assessment report <laughs> to, to, to get to the point where we could start wondering whether or not demand was a knob we also maybe should be thinking about turning. And because as you say, that knob can be turned in a more rapid way and in fact, a more effective way. So that's one of the things we're seeing is that also if we take into account sustainable development goals, uh, demand reductions are much better in terms of achieving sustainable demand um, sustainable development goals, including poverty alleviation, um, including uh, hunger, uh, protection against hunger, including biodiversity and other goals. So it turns out that demand reductions um, really square the circle for a lot of different conjoined crises that we're seeing. So one of the points I'd really like to make here is that we have a, we're living in a very different world, according to this report, than we were living in just a decade ago. So one of the things that we're seeing is that the technologies available, both on the production side and on the demand side, have advanced to such an extent that it is really viable um, to imagine a very, very different future where we can do things like have energy demand and still have decent living conditions for everybody. So I think that that's one thing to understand is that what is true now based on existing technologies and their, their current state is was not true 10, 20, 30 years ago. So we're really different living in a in a world that allows us to move forward much faster. Another point that is really crucial to make and that internally in the IPCC we had a bit of a struggle with, I must admit, is that um, demand reductions are not the same as individual behavior. And that was something that we had to keep bringing in every meeting, every conversation, because everybody who was involved with the demand chapter knew this, but everybody who wasn't involved with the demand chapter really immediately conflated uh, demand reductions and individual behavior. And so one of the core things is that um, one of the, the most important messages to take home from this report is that addressing demand in a serious way means moving away from this individual behavior sort of punitive framework that um, overconsumption and uh, in some cases underconsumption have been framed in. So we're really moving away from this idea that you, the consumer, are bad, and we're really moving towards facilitating low carbon, low energy lifestyles for people and what that means in practice. And what it means in practice, uh, and I recommend that you look at the supplement for policymakers, especially figure SPM6, is it means studying combinations of factors that have to do with social cultural factors, infrastructure and technologies. And the point being that these knobs are not individual behavior knobs. These knobs are wider societal uh, transformations that make it possible for people to live well at lower um, energy demand. And uh, so, so this is really a paradigm shift away from things that, for instance, Lewis and Kenji have termed uh, very accurately uh, consumer scapegoating. This, this, we're really moving moving away from that. And I think that that's very positive in terms of the story we have to tell about this positive different future. This is not um, this is not the, the again, this is a very, very different direction. So we need to talk about investment in systemic transformations, and that investment is generally public investment. We're talking about creating public services and public infrastructures that give people universal access to low carbon, um, decent lives. That's basically the goal. And what these look like is they look like um, 
uh, different things in different sectors. So in terms of transport, it means um, having cities and urban settlements. These are described, for instance, in Chapter 8, where um, sort of access to services is available for everybody uh, without having to travel high distances. It means in the in the building sector, it means retrofitted buildings and having access to high efficiency appliances. You know, these are things that maybe people can't afford, but maybe they can, but they can still be deployed throughout society um, through public investment. Um, it's also talking about what this means for nutrition, for the for the food sector. So it's very hard to see how climate, uh, you know, 1.5 or well below two degree future can be modeled at um, if people continue to increase their uh, consumption of meat and animal products in their diets. So we're talking about plant based, the shift to plant based diets, which are uh, also healthier. So that's a great, great piece of good news um, and recommended by uh, other organizations like the, the World Health Organization. But again, these are can be facilitated through things like um, public, uh, publicly available food choice architecture through, the, for instance, through things like institutional canteens, um, we're talking about in hospitals, foods, workplaces, and also through rules and super, you know, rules and supermarkets um, in terms of how, how things are presented. So I know there's a move in Europe for um, uh, vegan meat and dairy alternatives not to be labeled as meat and dairy alternatives, but, you know, that's something that obviously should, should be reconsidered. Um, in terms of what that investment means, uh, so there is a very interesting uh, paper by Kickstra et al, which is quite um, influential here in 2021, where they estimated the energy investment required for this transformation, this infrastructure transformation. And they found that it would be on the order of a bit less, but on the order of one year of energy consumption of the whole planet. So that's the sort of order of magnitude of, in, of investment in physical terms that we're talking about. It's not minor, but it's also not going to break anybody's bank within the next, you know, within the next couple of decades to invest that level and reorient it towards this low energy demand future. Um, I think another point here is that 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 investment shifts things. So, for instance, there's a lot of investment to be made in the building sector, but then thereafter, the building sector stops consuming as much energy. So, you know, it's a one time investment that pays off into the future. Another point is that this is a systemic perspective. So indeed, it has sectoral um, translations, but in general, it uh, it also can the 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 IPCC not only considers demand throughout the sectors, uh, so specifically in Chapter 5 and then throughout the different sectoral chapters, but it also considers systemic um, perspectives, for instance, in urban and other settlements in Chapter 8. So we're really starting to get a sense of what this means on the ground in terms of facilitating low energy and low carbon um, modes of life. And another point to make is that the demand, the major demand reductions and major emission reductions required for uh, industrial sectors can be greatly facilitated by reductions in um, overconsumption and uh, and demand. And so I think another point here is that this this aspect of sufficiency, which is for the first time mentioned and defined in um, the IPCC's supplement for pol uh, summary for policymakers, uh, really the, this this idea of sufficiency really ena again enables a lot of good things to happen throughout the whole uh, transformation we need to do to get to very, very low carbon emissions very, very soon. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Julia. And thanks for the work <laughs> putting all of this together. It's really striking how important this sort of public investment and public action is in facilitating the kinds of choices, the nudging that, that, uh, that we're talking about. But uh, I'd like to toss a question toward uh, you, Elisa. Uh, given how long you've been working on this question and asking governments to address consumption and to engage in this. How do you see this report as changing that discussion? Thank you very much, Marcus, and, and thank you, Julia, for bringing us fully into the, the key messages of the report. And uh, it somehow takes me back also to a series of scientific evidences that have been pointing us to the direction of how important it is to address the full spectrum of what we call under goal 12 sustainable consumption and production and how important it is for us to accelerate the speed and the attention which is given to the 
consumption angle of that system approach. So just uh, a few years back in the uh, in the emission gap report, there were also some strong messages and figures that were pointing our attention on how important it was uh, from a consumption based accounting, the private household consumption amounting to two thirds uh, of the global emissions. And there were three sectors that were highlighted in the emission gap report as those sectors that are uh, equally responsible for 20% of lifestyles emission. And these were mobility, the residential and the food sectors. And starting from there, we're now coming to an IPCC report that uh, really highlights very strongly the importance of working on the combination of consumption and production and reminds us that historically, we've probably been somehow relatively more prone <laughs> and more experienced into looking at the production angle of these equations. We have several years of history that date back to cleaner production and resource efficiency solution. And we've not run at the same speed, if you want to say, um, in addressing the consumption angle. And Julia is stressing one important element that I would want to underline. Uh, as I think it is somehow making the trick in helping us see how we can accelerate that uh, part of the of the system, the, the consumption part of the system, which is recognizing that uh, the solution is not necessarily in putting the spotlight only on the individual consumer's behavior. There's so much we can transform if our lens is so narrowly focused. We need to understand how we can zoom out and understand where what we need to transform in the system in the way in which our consumption and production works for uh, sustainable lifestyles being the new normal and therefore how we can create an enabling policy environment enabling infrastructure, the right incentives, but also how we work with businesses in such a way that the sustainable choices and the sustainable options are the ones that each and every one of us can easily find in the market and therefore make it easy for us to somehow make the right choice in terms of uh, living more sustainably. So I, I would like to maybe stress specifically from the uh, introduction that was made, this specific dimension that we really need to understand what is our focus when we want to address sustainable consumption and what, who are the actors that we need to target if we want to change that system. Marcus, I guess you're on mute. This was the most commonly stated phrase of 2021. I think you're still on mute. <laughs> so thank you for that uh, overview and, and for emphasizing this sort of systems perspective that says that this this entire puzzle needs to be grappled with. We can't push responsibility off onto uh, one portion of the of the puzzle or one one scale. And with that in mind, this is sort of a slow pitch to uh, to Magnus because you've been advocating sustainable lifestyles for many years. Uh, but I would I would say that the the understanding that we need to couple that with actions at other levels uh, is a is a fairly new, at least in its widespread sense, is a new development. Do you see that as as offering breakthroughs? You're still on mute. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, I think he was frozen up, so why don't uh, well, we'll come back to that question uh, quite easily because Magnus will present the the uh, uh, the policy brief and the details, and it's there that it becomes apparent where some of these um, uh, 
the choice editing and the government, uh, the policy uh, support comes in to support those kind of sustainable options. So let's move now over uh, to Emma Lurian. And uh, again, Emma was the chair of this cross party committee on environmental objectives in Sweden, started in 2000. Uh, her work started in 2018. Uh, and Emma will describe to us a little bit the importance not only of setting targets at the government level uh, and mobilizing the, the, the citizens across the country, but also the importance of doing that in a way that maximizes the consensus across parties so that uh, once the consensus has been built, it's, it's much more effective to move forward with a set of policies. So Emma, uh, Let's pass over to you, and I believe you had some slides as well that you wanted to share. Thank you so much, uh, Marcus and uh, the panel. Uh, so I'm very happy and uh, pleased to be invited to this and to share some examples of how we work with this in Sweden. And I'm not sure I should show any slides. I think it's maybe easier to just uh, talk maybe let's see well as uh, marcus said my name is emma and uh, uh, i have to correct you on one thing i used to be a member of the national party uh, national parliament but now i'm uh, working on the local and, and the regional level but who knows what's happened in the election coming up uh, but as the chair of this cross-party committee on the environmental objectives. I'm just a chair and a facilitator. I don't represent any party. But within this committee, there is one person from each party in the Swedish parliament. And I will have to give you a little background. Um, Sweden has, has its uh, environmental uh, aims and targets since 1999. And they had a wide range between healthy seas and living forests and so on. And we should achieve this within a generation and hand over the nation and the planet to the next generation in a better way and a better shape than we got it. Uh, unfortunately, quite soon we saw that this will not work uh, or we didn't achieve these uh, goals or this uh, system. And there was a national board or with um, scientists giving advice to the uh, to the government of how to do this. But even if they were clever and said what was needed to be done, there was no policy within this. And it was hard to make policies out of the suggestion that we got. So about 10 years after, 2010, they made up this way instead. It's called this uh, uh, committee with cross-party board where all parties are uh, have a seat and it's used to try to solve complex environmental issues or uh, objectives to try to with away from the everyday policy making and the media try to together with with uh, NGOs, civil society, experts, uh, scientists, authorities, trade and industry, businesses and so on, try to see, OK, learn together. What is the problem? What do we know? And then, OK, if we agree upon this fact, what can we do then? And of course, different parties, different ideologies have different solutions on this. Uh, different uh, objectives, but we try together to build on <laughs> the first stepping stone. OK, if we agree upon this, how can we reach this and this and this and try to make it some policy, a layer of policies that everyone, as many as possible, can agree upon. And uh, this has been very successful during the years. In 2007, we got a large political majority in Sweden's Riksdag to introduce a climate policy framework with a climate act for Sweden. And this was, it's an ambitious uh, 
the framework is very ambitious with climate goals. It was groundbreaking at that time. And but now it's integrated in the everyday policies and many countries have uh, also uh, looked into this and it's uh, one of the role models for the climate act we have in EU. So now what was groundbreaking then is actually something neutral. And back to this day's topic, because we needed to, to the next step was how to tackle the climate uh, um, the emissions from from consumption based uh, emissions, how to tackle that. And here it's a lot of emotions. Can you say to people what to eat? Can you make uh, policies of how to transport and so on? And it was a lot of feelings and a lot of different ideas and ideology behind this. But we sat it down together for more than a year. As I said, together with experts, we had the time, we have a safe room, everyone can say what they want and we know it will not end up in the media. And we actually built this trust, even if it was so hard during Corona. Uh, I mean, it's harder to have these meetings online than to be in the same room. But in April, we were actually done. And this uh, committee proposed that the Swedish Riksdag, the Swedish Parliament, shall adopt a long term climate target for Sweden's consumption based emission as a part of this environmental quality objective, reduce climate impact. And we will achieving a net zero emission 2045. And within this, we have targets for climate impact of consumption, climate impact of export, of aviation, shipping and public procurement. And all parties from the left to the right in the Swedish party uh, parliament is actually behind this. And we had a joint press conference where all parties had a say of what we have come up together. And I think that is very unique. I don't think there has been anyone like that. And what I would say with is that you need to have the understanding together and if these are so important issues and if we want to last for a long time, we need to have this understanding, but it's only targets so far and the aiming and now it's up to the coming governments and, and uh, parliament to fill it up and make sure that we get actions, but at least to have all parties behind this and see the goal net zero 2045. I think that's a great achievement and a great start and what I know, no other countries have done it. And I think I stopped there. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Emma, and for all the work setting those uh, uh, targets and, and building agreement. I recall when, when we spoke last week, you spoke about the importance of this group being led by, uh, by the scientific information, uh, but also that the value of it being led by a scientist. Could could you speak for just a moment to that and what role that played in being able to establish the, the consensus that you uh, developed? Yeah, I think this is one of many different reports this committee have done. And as you see, it's a big, thick book with uh, a lot of pages. And we have to agree upon the knowledge and the science together. So almost one third of the, the time has been inviting uh, different scientists, different parts of the society and saying, OK, this is what it looks like. And OK, do we agree upon this? And sometimes they say, no, I don't. I think that's uh, your opinion, but it's fact. We have to make sure that we at least have the fact. You can say different conclusions from it, but you need to agree upon it. And when you hear it from different sources and sometimes they differ, OK, where is the thing? But when we can agree upon this, then we have something to stand on and re build on. Because if we don't agree upon the facts, then it doesn't matter. And we actually got all the parties, even those who don't think this is the most important matter of the world, uh, to say that, OK, it looks like this. Let's try to solve it. So the scientific community and all these policy brief and, and the big consensus is so important to have, otherwise it will not happen. 
Great, thank you uh, so much for that. Um, we're all welcome to our own opinions, but not our own facts. I think is the is a fairly well known quote. Uh, Elisa, I I wonder, given this kind of progress and the fact that that Sweden's targets now are the first uh, set of targets that are comprehensive in this way, uh, and that they still need to be channeled into uh, policy initiatives. How do you see UNEP uh, as engaging with Sweden to take this this process forward as another consensus based uh, organization scientifically anchored? Marcus, uh, the, the presentations that we've been hearing in, in your question make me think of, of three uh, very interesting directions um, we should be working on. One is the note on which Emma uh, ended and on which our, our former presentation was focusing, which is the strong need of scientific foundation of whatever we're putting forward and whatever we're discussing. So all the elements that are coming in from very strong and solid reports are going to help us make the case. And as much as possible, we can contextualize them to the specific needs of the countries and regions in which we're working, the stronger the messages will be in our um, uh, advice and inspiring for action. The second element I want to bring to the table is, and Marcus, I'll, I'll feel a bit ashamed to say that in front of you, because I want to allude at the potential of replication and multiplying of uh, the One Planet Network. And you'll correct me if I'm going off track because you are the co-lead of the program I want to refer to, which is the Sustainable Lifestyle and Education program. But I do see that convening having a huge potential of bringing forward initiatives such as the one that Emma was sharing with us and the whole process of achieving that result and understanding which were the bottlenecks and which were the solutions that were put forward is extremely insightful for those who want to follow the path that Emma was sharing with us. And that convening in that space is definitely fundamental for uh, for those who are keen to work on this agenda to be able to, to experiment and learn. And the third idea that I want to put on the table is one that moves towards taking those messages and innovating in new areas. Uh, Marcus, I'm sure you know that one of the big outcomes or, you know, the ones that went to the to the press of our last UN Environment Assembly is one that concentrates on the agenda of plastic pollution. And there as well, we will have to really look in depth of what are the potentials of distilling the lessons that we're learning on triggering sustainable lifestyles and bringing them into that process. So it will really be fundamental to understand which were the key drivers and the key conditions that enabled us to change, to promote more sustainable behavior and more sustainable lifestyles and distill them as early as possible in the process that is unfolding now and that will hopefully take us to an uh, international legally binding instrument to address that challenge. So I do see a lot of opportunities emerging from that conversation, Marcus. That's uh, very encouraging. I, I like that challenge. <laughs> and uh, just as some background, we've had some discussions about the, the work that the program has done to date uh, and where we think the impact can be can be magnified going forward. And it's pretty clear we we have a lot of knowledge. Uh, the challenge for us now is to identify the ways to uh, to engage that knowledge in in actions at all of the scales at the household scale, at the the uh, commercial enterprise, the business scale uh, and at the government scale. And uh, that sets the stage really nicely for Magnus to come in and talk about these actions at the government scale that reshape uh, the options that we have. And let me just throw in one more item. I, I lived in the state of Texas as a vegetarian about 40 years ago. Uh, and I can tell you that challenges of living as a vegetarian in the middle of Texas were, were much more difficult 
than uh, the challenges of living as vegetarian here in Sweden. And 40 years later, and it makes that set of choices much, much easier and much, much more automatic to move uh, to stick with plant based food. So it's it's that kind of shaping uh, that that we're looking for. But without any further uh, background, I will pass the floor over to Magnus. Um, he's got some slides and will walk us through the thinking behind the uh, the choice editing and the, the the importance of government and setting the 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 structure within which we make our choices. So Magnus, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus. And uh, sorry, I've lost my connection here before. Obviously, a sabotage by someone who tries to silence me. It's like the plastics industry. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Uh, so I will try in the next few minutes here to um, present this policy brief, or at least to give you a flavor of uh, what we are, the ideas that we put forward here in our new publication that we have the pleasure of co-publishing together with UNEP. Next slide, please. And the policy brief is called, uh, it includes the term climate emergency, and I'm very happy that UNEP actually decided to use this very strong language because that's what we find ourselves in. We need uh, drastic changes, immediate changes. That's what the science is telling us. Uh, we heard Julia talking before as one of the IPCC lead authors. Uh, she can attest to the, the, the need for these, these cuts to be both immediate and drastic. If you want to deliver on the climate promises that governments have signed on to. And it would be naive to think that these changes can happen only by improving technologies and be, by with um, people's everyday lives in every single little detail going on as if, if as if nothing else had changed. There will be changes in how we live our everyday lives, uh, especially for those of us who have currently a very large carbon footprint. Um, I think that's also clear from, from the scientific literature. Um, and uh, Julia mentioned that an increasing openness and an increasing uh, interest in demand side reductions. And of course, that's why uh, this chapter is included in, in the work of IPCC these days. Next slide, please. So what one of the uh, concepts that we put forward in the uh, policy brief is um, uh, this one, uh, the need for the transition here to be fair uh, and equitable, that um, we need to uh, start talking about both overconsumption. We need to acknowledge that th there is actually so something like overconsumption that has been um, um, you know, off the table for a long, long time, but we see now an increasing openness to actually talking about overconsumption in those terms and the need to scale down consumption. At the same time, of course, there are many people who are struggling to meet even basic needs and to live in a way that makes it possible for them to uh, participate in society in an active and meaningful way. And of course, we need to provide the opportunities for these people to increase their consumption and to to, to live fuller and, and uh, fuller lives and healthier lives. Um, so we need to have this double um, uh, objectives in mind when we, when we go forward. And we have here in the middle of the figure also the key consumption areas that we need to focus on. Eliza mentioned some of them before with food, housing and transport that stand out and really are responsible for um, the lion's share of, of our carbon emissions. Next slide, please. And um, lifestyles, uh, of course, are very complex and they are influenced by a multitude of factors. But um, this is a, a framework that um, we have developed over the years uh, that highlights that try to group these factors into three separate categories um, that are really key to shaping uh, the way we live. Um, it highlights attitudes, includes values, uh, knowledge, social norms. Um, and the second one, facilitators, uh, what things cost, what we can afford in the marketplace, uh, what we have access to, what we have rights to access. Is there a public park that I have the rights to access or am I excluded? Do I have to pay? 
what kind of information we have about the performance of different types of products and options and the infrastructure, the hardware. It's also necessary. Um, Mr. Khan talked, be talked before about the software, but we also need the hardware to be there, the products and the systems that enable us to live more sustainably. So this is one of the frameworks that we present in the in the policy brief as one of the building blocks. And the next slide, please. In addition to this, to these three factors, the attitudes, facilitators and the infrastructure, we also put forward another model, um, a need to shift the consumption patterns and lifestyle patterns from where we are currently to drastically decarbonize uh, patterns of living and consuming. And to do that, we um, arguing that the choice editing approach is necessary and will be helpful. And it has three elements as we understand it. It involves both editing out the bad options, the highly carbon intensive options that are mainly only providing um, benefits to a few people and that we could actually live without. Um, we don't necessarily need cars in downtown areas. Um, very few people do actually have um, a need for things like extremely heavy utility vehicles and so on. Um, maybe we should have a discussion around whether these options should really be available even uh, in the marketplace. At the same time, we need to edit in um, the better options, the low carbon options, which are not always in the in the in, in the form of products, but can also be in terms of other need satisfiers. I talked about carbon intensive cars before. Here it can be about other kinds of options, public transportation or or a city structure that makes it uh, safe and easy to, to transport or, or to bicycle or, or to, to walk around. And the third element here, when we are doing this shift of editing in and, and editing out, we also need to make sure that we ensure that everyone in society has access to the goods and services that we need to live in health and, and, and equitably. Because in this transition to, to, towards low carbon, um, this will be turbulent and there is a, an overhanging risk that low income groups can be can be negatively affected. And if we don't really pay enough concern to that or pay attention to that, um, we will really get stuck. And, and this is essential for building public understanding and, and acceptance for, for this, trans, this transformation. So the three elements here of a choice editing approach and choice editing it might sound quite drastic, but it's something that governments are already doing in many areas, often to protect people's health or or public law and public order. Uh, but um, but it, it is also being applied to um, energy intensive products and, and so on and so forth. And we have building codes, etc. And those things could be used much more actively than they are uh, uh, than they are currently. Next slide, please. So what we do here in the policy brief is that we put together these two frameworks, the uh, uh, attitudes facilitate their infrastructure framework and this choice editing um, uh, pillars, as I just introduced to you. And we then get this, what we can call the AFIS matrix for enabling sustainable lifestyles. If we look at these attitudes, if you look at these facilitators and infrastructure and what it would mean to edit in and edit out and ensuring access, I don't have time to go through this in detail, but I hope that you will uh, find this, this interesting and uh, look at the details in the policy brief itself. What we then do is that we apply this to key, key sectors. So we look at what could this mean for transportation, for example? What could it mean to carbon intensive food consumption? Um, and to identify some existing policies in each of these cells of this matrix. Uh, to, to give some, some little examples, to give some, um, some feeling for, for what this could look like in reality. Um, and we, the message we are putting out here, the, the most essential message is here that individual policies to address lifestyles taken by themselves will not be very successful, will not have a very good chance of being successful. We need good combinations, cleverly designed combinations of policy tools. Um, following these principles, as I have been talking about, addressing both the A, the F and the I, 
and working with editing in, editing out, and ensuring equitable access. If we do that in a systematic fashion, uh, designing com combined policy interventions, it's only then that we can effectively start shifting, shifting uh, lifestyles in a manner that is also equitable. And that is key to building the public acceptance and, and making this poli politically feasible. Um, so I think my time is out, so I end there and more details are in the policy brief itself. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Magnus, and for the work that you've put into pulling all of this together. Um, let, let me just ask you, though, uh, I mean, often when we introduce new approaches to uh, problem solving, people get all worried um, and and react to because they're worried that uh, that they're not ready for prime time, that they'll cause lots of disruption. But what I heard you saying is that the choice editing strategy is actually adapted from other areas of policy. This is not a new governmental activity. What's new here is the, the, the way that you've systematized it and applied it to specific sectors. Is that right? Yeah, correctly, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, choice editing as, as a concept, uh, as a principle, um, has always been around. I mean, governments right. always set the rules for the marketplace in one way or another. And and um, so there are precedents in many areas. There are many things that we are not allowed to buy or, or, or use the way we want to. Um, and every, m most people accept that. Um, yeah. And um, that could be could be used more actively. Currently, we see that that uh, um, governments are often very timid when it comes to addressing addressing uh, products and markets, but uh, with a growing understanding amongst the general public about the need for this transition, a stronger demand for low carbon uh, transformation, uh, increasingly uh, politicians will feel uh, emboldened and ready to, to step up and, and uh, work more systematically and, and take steps that might see, seem uh, drastic uh, currently, but uh, may soon be be feasible. But as I as you said here before, what we are putting out here is not something entirely new. It's something that maybe sounds very common sense, but I think that's also the, the strength of it, that it's it's uh, it's not too, too complicated. It makes intuitive sense and it's easy to apply uh, and it's based on things that are already up and running. But if we connect the dots and if we work more systematically, it could have greater impact. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, let's let's take this over to Julia and Emma. Um, and uh, I'm I'm curious when we when we look at the sectors that uh, that we're applying this uh, this regulatory strategy to, some of those are faster than others, right? So, for example, we have food and transport that are often uh, spur the moment decisions. We have built environment, which is very much not a spur of the moment uh, decision. Do you see these as different kinds of challenges or does the does the framework apply equally well? We just need to think in terms of a longer time frame for, for example, built environment. Maybe I can bounce it over to Julia first and then come back to Elisa. So I think that the I think that a lot of different actors play into these decisions, and that's one of the things that one has to think through in terms of this this idea of choice editing as well. Uh, so even food as a spur of the moment decision, supermarkets know how to use that, right? <laughs> and so reorienting the way supermarkets are going to be uh, selling food in order to reorient towards healthier plant-based diets, that's something that is certainly not a spur of the moment uh, decision. It's something that has to do with the decision between you know health systems and governance and uh, the supermarket system themselves and just to give an example i think it was i hate to be giving advertisement for but i think it was actually burger king who says that two-thirds of their food is going to be vegan by 2030 or something because they have so many plant-based alternatives that are viable um so I, I might be getting the numbers wrong but so that's that's something that um i think that the, what the framework does is it gives a systematic way of thinking through who is doing what for what purpose at what at what level of the decision making chain and i think that that's very useful for any actor be it in industry 
or in the public sector or in research in order to reorient this decision making. So basically we have to take um, one of the ways I like to think about these sufficiency approaches or um, well-being at lower resource use approaches is in terms of economic democracy is how do we make decisions? How do we get different actors to make decisions that prioritize well-being within planetary limits along different way along different chains, supply chains and consumption patterns? And I think that this framework um, helps think through that in a systematic way that is very positive. So what I hear you describing and correcting me on is that even in these spaces where our consumption feels like spontaneous decisions. Those decisions are structured by upstream choices that, that a company has made about what products it'll make available. Uh, so yeah. that if, if the better choices aren't there, it's very hard to make them, i.e. Absolutely. Texas. And transport is yeah. even more so, right? So transport sure. infrastructures, you know, creating a safe transport infrastructure can be done relatively fast, but the the, the lifetime of transport infrastructures and the decisions that are made uh, can be very long indeed. And that does shape how people then um, live and uh, take occupy their time and occupy the rest of their consumption. Sure, yes. Elisa, from, uh, from the UNAP perspective, how do you see those well, I'm, I'm probably going to tie into uh, one of the issues that has been uh, focusing a lot of our attention recently, which is uh, how we can help uh, the idea of more circular system of resources in production and consumption uh, be also conceptualized in terms of recognizing that they will not work, they will not function unless we bring in at an early stage of conceptualization also the uh, the lifestyles aspects and the consumption aspect early on and we make sure that we actually create the right condition for these to be the the preferred choice uh, Marcus, I was actually going through uh, some of the questions that were coming our way and one was particularly uh, capturing my attention and was um, pointing us our attention to uh, both the scales at which uh, those systems have to operate, but also one question was helping us see what is the level of information that reaches uh, and inspire our lifestyles and our behavior and how important it is for these to be conceptualized in where that behavior, that lifestyle happen for these to be as effective as possible. And I'm just going to bring in one example just to show how all the pieces of the puzzle tie in together. Uh, another program of the One Planet Network, the Consumer Information Program, did recently as an assessment looking at how information reaches consumers to, again, going back to the earlier challenge to um, reduce uh, pollution of plastics from plastic. And what was particularly interesting was to highlight how that information was totally disconnected in many instances from the infrastructure available, from the opportunities that are there in the market, from the incentives uh, that are there and therefore making uh, the most uh, environmentally friendly solution the most expensive. Um, so unless we really look at those different pieces of the equation and make sure they are all pointing in the same direction, we're actually going to make it particularly hard <laughs> for behaviors and lifestyles to be the ones that are, um, let's say, aligned with the vision that we want to accomplish. And uh, knowing better the reality and the context in which uh, those behaviors have to materialize is extremely important to be able to give the right signal to um, each and every one of us. So what I hear you saying in part is that it's also really important to have the right information at the right time about the right product, uh, because being overwhelmed with information is uh, is something we're all struggling with all the time. Yeah. 
I want to, we've got a couple of questions from the audience, but I first wanted to bounce a question to Emma. Um, having, having developed these targets and the consensus around that, do you, how do you see this framework as contributing to the, to the, the process of thinking through how do we, how do we translate this into policy here in Sweden? Do you see that as a, as a framework that can be adopted into that, into that discussion and used in a useful way? Yes, I see. I mean, as you talk about now, these these concepts, it's something that you can look into and see. Okay, if we do this and this and this, it might work. The thing is, someone have to be the first, and that was something that was uh, the struggle for us. It was one a little tickling uh, and challenging for for the policymakers and the politicians in the audience that okay, no one else have done this. But it was also scary because we don't know if we will work. But if we have these concepts that you have worked through and you can apply, it, I think um, it can actually be a very great tool because someone have more than <laughs> ourselves have been thinking through the steps. And that's uh, something good. And um, we also have to see what's what's really uh, what came forward in, in our work was that the transition must be just. We can, as UN, leave no one behind, is also within the country. And OK, but if we do this action, what happened to these people and, and this category of, of the people? And OK, but the, the people that uh, work, uh, make a living from this, what happened to this? So if we have this been thinking through and we have this uh, framework and looking into this and we have the answer to some of the questions that you have put up here in the policy brief. You say that if we do this, this will happen. Mm -hmm. Then it's a little bit easier and you have a few more steps on the way. And I think that's very useful. But someone has to be the first. Um, indeed, somebody has always got to be out front. And the advantage is that if there's something similar to work from, it makes it easier to step out in that way, right? So we have a, a really good question here from Alberto that speaks about the interventions to facilitate sustainable lifestyles, but is there any indication of, of what scale, how do we think about local, regional, national, even global scales? Uh, is there a way to, to think about how we engage uh, across those scales in order to uh, to target the spaces that are most ready to move uh, or most impactful. And I guess we could open that for Elisa or Julia or Emma, any of you. It's a real challenge. Marcus, I'm, I'm ready to kickstart and uh, I, I was already <laughs> reflecting on, on that point when, uh, uh, when I was addressing your earlier question. And it is indeed, um, it speaks to a need of uh, really having a full understanding of the context in which we are operating and um, who are the actors in that context and what is the type of change that we can achieve in that context. Uh, in earlier interventions, we, we were alluding to, you know, having to transform the production and consumption system, which frequently look at the whole value chain. But actually, when you zoom into a city and maybe let me flag that a lot of the transformation that we see happening and a lot of the in, uh, innovations are actually emerging in the context of cities. So uh, bravo to what happens at the level of cities. Well, when we zoom into that specific context, we need to really understand what are the boundaries that we're going to operate in and who are the actors that can uh, trigger the change in that context. And therefore, uh, we somehow need to be able to adapt some of the um, strong scientific evidence that Emma was alluding to in her intervention to that specific context so that we're able to understand which are the main drivers of transformation. Uh, and obviously um, 
build on the leaders that are already there and that can um, again, as Emma was alluding, maybe be the one that uh, spearhead the transformation. Click my microphone again here. Thank you uh, a lot here. We've got some interesting uh, questions here, but I see that we're out of time. Um, and I want to pass over to you again, Elisa, to, to sort of give us an overview and a, a wrap up. Let me just mention uh, one of these questions and maybe you can pick up on that thread in your uh, in your wrap up. But it the question is thinking about different ministries. Uh, are there some that are more suitable than others to take the lead in these kinds of things? Um, and that may very well be a function of what sector we're talking about and we we have a number of sectors here but having uh, thrown that extra wrench into the works for you let me pass back over to you elisa and uh to sort of provide a wrap up for us and then we'll close off the um the webinar thank you very much marcus <laughs> Thanks, Marcus. And it seems impossible to do justice to all the ideas and, and messages that emerged during today's session. But we've really been uh, uh, delighted to hear from um, two parts of the world uh, in Sweden and in India, where we have really uh, leadership on promoting and taking these, uh, these agenda forward. And these being really the, the cases that would inspire, would take forward the transformation. And these have been coupled with uh, a strong scientific foundation from the IPCC report, from earlier report, and from uh, um, that has uh, been the basis around which the policy brief that has been uh, described today by Magnus uh, have been identifying which are the options, which are the opportunities that are in front of us to inspire and influence uh, uh, more sustainable lifestyles and enable them, make uh, create the right environment for this to be the new norm. Um, Marcus, you have put a, a challenge to me in terms of who needs to go first. Is there a ministry or an authority that needs to own this agenda? And I have to say that it's difficult to identify one that would take the lead, uh, but it's definitely a need for a coordinated and transversal effort because it's very rarely sitting in the uh, responsibilities of one minister only to trigger that systemic transformation that Julia was alluding to. Therefore, everybody needs to feel that the challenge is owned by all of them, that they have a common vision and a common objective, and that they are putting all their instrument measures and solutions in place to achieve that common goal. And Marcus, I'm going to end by quoting one sentence that was delivered in my in our keynote intervention and that particularly captured my attention and, and gave um, an interesting spin to the conversation, which is around um, making sure that we do really value the importance of our sustainable lifestyle and sustainable behavior. And our, our keynote speak, speaker was reminding us that it's important to make people realize that they're making a difference to the world and their behavior and their style, lifestyle are indeed making a difference to the world. So by referring to our keynote address, Marcus, I hand it back to you to close our um, webinar today. Thank you, Elisa. And that, uh, I don't think I can top that, but let me just point to a couple of uh, points here that, that are especially important. I think the sense of making a contribution uh, that our keynote and that you highlighted. The importance of thinking in terms of uh, cities, it's where people live and work and do the consumption. Uh, it's also uh, an entity that is well organized to share lessons that can be emulated around the planet. So it's perhaps even the best 
space that uh, that we have for for sharing these kinds of examples. Uh, Magnus made a made a point that it's important that all the ministries be part of this, even if there's one that takes the lead. And I'll close my closing with the point that uh, made by Jean Monnet early on in the European Union, who said it's usually best to follow the path of least resistance. So if we're looking for first movers, let's let's work with the with the folks who are interested in in taking the ball and running with it, uh, and and moving this forward, and we'll bring on others as we move. So, final words. I really want to thank uh, the panelists and our keynote speaker. I want to thank you especially for making my job easy by staying like amazingly within our timeframes, uh, providing really sharp and insightful comments and. Uh, and for the work that you do outside of this webinar that you that you brought in for us. So it is so essential. And uh, and finally, thank you to you in the audience for joining us. Uh, we uh, encourage you to follow up with emails with questions that you've got and we'll do our, our best to respond. So thank you very much for this afternoon and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all. Along the way. Thanks.